Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Xiao Wei Jia from the University of Minnesota, and I'm going to join the University of Pittsburgh as a faculty member starting from fall 2020. And today I would like to cover the use of domain knowledge for model initialization and model design. So now that Zheng Jie has covered that um, it's possible to use domain knowledge to guide our design of loss functions. But in practice, there are, there are many more general and more complex relationships for domain knowledge that cannot be directly expressed as part of the loss function or as a regularizer. Um, and also sometimes it's, it's just because these relationships are, uh, are not differentiable, even after we do some approximations. So that's why we are thinking uh, whether it's possible for us to directly transfer knowledge from these domain knowledge based models itself because these domain knowledge or DK based simulator, they usually uh, contain many different types of domain knowledge. And these domain experts may spend like 20, 30 years in building such kind of DK based models. So they contain very rich information. So one thing is like we can use this or we can treat this DK based simulator as a black box. And then we can run this DK based simulator to generate simulation data. And then we can use such simulation data to pre-train our machine learning models. And basically by doing this pre-training, we are using machine learning model to mimic the behaviors of this DK based simulator. And the idea is that we know like these days, these machine learning models, deep learning models, they have very complex structures. So they usually require a large amount of training data to tune those model parameters. But we know like these DK based simulators running this DK based simulator doesn't require any true, true observation data or training data. So that mean, means we can generate large amount of simulation data. And if we can pre-train this complex machine learning model using large amount of simulation data, then it's very likely that this machine learning model can already get much closer to its target solution. Then it only requires very few amount of uh, true observation data to fine tune itself to get to this target solution. And we show this uh, process of pre-training and fine tuning using these two pictures at the bottom. So basically, we can see that during the pre-training phase, we are actually using our machine learning model as emulator for DK-based model. But remember, like DK-based models, they usually um, use a lot of approximations. So that means they usually have a have certain uh, inherent model bias. So there is there can be a gap between our simulations and the true underlying patterns. But still, because these DK-based models is usually being built using many general um, domain knowledge or physical relationships, so it's still able to, to some extent, these DK-based models can capture these kind of spatial and temporal relationships that are used to build these kind of DK-based models. So once the pre-trained model can correctly capture such kind of spatial or temporal uh, relationships, then what it needs is just very few true observation data points allow these underlying true patterns to close such gap. And that's how fine tuning works. And here we've shown uh, some results for the same example of modeling lake water temperature. So this experiment is conducted in Lake Mendota in Wisconsin. And Lake Mendota is actually um, the most widely studied lake in the US. And, and here we implemented three different types of methods. The first one, general lake model, and that uh, this model is a purely uh, fixed space model or as purely based on domain knowledge. And it's also the state of the art for modeling lake water temperature and it's currently used by USGS. And the second one is a pure black box machine learning model, recurrent neural network model. And here we use the long short term memory cell within this recurrent neural network structure. And the third one is our proposed method basically is the, is the same recurrent neural network model, but first get pre-trained using the simulation data generated by this general lake model and then get fine tuned using our true observation or training data. And all of our training and testing data are randomly selected from a nine year period from 2009 to 2017. And as we mentioned, like the pre-training in the pre-training phase, we can use large amount of simulation data. So in this case, we do the pre-training using the simulation data from the past 30 years. And in this figure, we show the performance. So here the X axis is the number of training samples and Y axis is the prediction error or the prediction RMSE, but it's in the reverse order. So basically we can see the, the one is on top and four, S, uh, four is at the bottom. So basically the higher, the better. 
And if we see these curves, if we just compare this R and the GRM, the domain knowledge based models, we can see that when we have sufficient training data, then this black box machine learning models performs much better than this DK based model. And the reason is that this DK based model, they usually use a lot of approximations because there are many physical, uh, physical processes that are still not fully understood by these domain scientists. So they have to use certain approximations to represent these physical processes. And by using these approximations, they introduce some additional model bias so that even if they have access to large amount of training data, they can still not fix uh, this kind of um, model bias. But on the other hand, if we only use very few amount of training data, then we can see this machine learning model performs much worse. And the reason is that these machine learning models uh, can easily overfit the training data. But this uh, GRM or the DK based model, the performance is relatively stable. And that's because it mostly rely on this kind of, uh, this kind of general physical relationship. And by combining these two types of models or by doing this per training, we got this top curve. And we can see this top curve, our proposed method actually has much better performance than either um, GRM or this uh, RNN model. And, the, and especially like we can see, even if we use just two days profile for training, we can still get better performance than the DK based model. And assume like if we have infinite number of training samples, then we can imagine this black box machine learning model RNN and this pre-train and fine tune model, they should have quite similar performance because the data size is already sufficiently large for this black box machine learning model to capture all this complex relationship by itself. So in this case, the pre-training is not very useful. And here we show, um, show an example of these um, water temperature predictions and see how this pre-training and fine tuning can help change these predictions. So basically these predictions are the uh, water temperatures in the middle layer of Lake Mendota. And these blue dots here are the true observations for uh, water temperatures. And this green line is the simulation data produced by this GRM or the DK based model. And if we just pre-train a machine learning model, an RNN model using this simulation data, then we get this black line. So we can see the black line can almost capture all the dynamic patterns of these simulation data. But still, this black line has a large gap with our true observation data. Then if we only fine tune, if we fine tune this uh, pre-trained model, this black line using just 2% of true observation data, then we can get this red line. We can see this now this red line has a much better matching with the true observation data. So this really shows that even if our simulation data is not perfect, it has large bias with the true observations. But still, by doing the pre-training using such simulation data, the model, the pre-trained pre model, have a higher chance at learning these kind of general seasonal patterns over time. And once we can get these seasonal patterns to be correct, then from there, we only need very few amount of true observation data to close this gap, to get this red line. And another, another uh, major concern about using this uh, pre-training strategy is that sometimes we may not have access to a set of perfect parameters within this DK based model to generate good simulation data. So for example, in this uh, lake modeling case, uh, one key parameter in this GRM, in this uh, DK based model is, is the geometry of these lake systems. So for example, this lake Mandola, this is a true geometry of lake Mandola. But if we don't have this information, we have to rely on some default parameters. So the first three uh, pictures, Martini, Cone, and Barrel, there are some default parameters for lake geometry. So here in this, in this slide, we just want to show like um, whether these pre-training are still going to be useful if we just use imperfect simulation data generated by using these default parameters. So basically here we can see that if we use uh, if we do the pre-training using this uh, simulation data generated by these default parameters and without doing any fine tuning, so we, we use 0% of data for, uh, for fine tuning, that means we just pre-train the model. And we can see the performance can get much worse. The prediction RMSE can get much higher, especially for barrel shape and martini shape. And that's because we can easily see that this martini shape and the barrel shape, they are far away from the true geometry of Lake Mandela. The cone shape is, uh, is relatively similar. 
So that's why we can see the cone shape, the, the, the performance is, is very close to the, uh, the performance using the true geometry. But even if this performance is getting much worse for the per-train model, but still we observe that as long as we feed in a small amount of true observation data for fine tuning like 2% or 20%, then we can see this machine learning model can quickly recover to get reasonable performance. So this shows that even if these simulation data are not perfect, are using a wrong set of uh, parameters, but still by doing this per training, this uh, machine learning model still have a higher chance to learn some general relationships that, are, that can be helpful for these prediction tasks. Another uh, good example is for traffic signal control. So basically here we are trying to determine the optimal strategy for control these traffic signals. And this problem actually can be naturally formulated as a sequential decision, uh, decision making problem using reinforcement learning, where we have the um, input states, uh, which consists of the current traffic volume from each lane and also the current traffic signals. And we are trying to determine what's the, what should be the traffic signal, signals that we should give at next time interval. And the reward is based on the total queue length for all the lanes. So basically the shorter the queue lengths, the, uh, the higher the reward. But one big concern about uh, reinforcement learning is that usually we need a good or a reasonable initial model to start with. And to get such initial model, these authors in this paper, they propose this strategy that they can first run a DK-based model called SOTL. So this is basically a simulation-based traffic model. And they can run this model to generate a set of simulation data samples. And each data sample consists of these four elements, the current state, uh, the next state, and the actions being taken, and there is the reward received by taking this action. Okay. So once we collect a large amount of these simulation uh, data samples, we can use them to train or pre-train this reinforcement learning uh, model so that we can get a good initialized point. And then from there, we can fine tune this reinforcement learning model using some true observations by doing this uh, actor and predict algorithm. So this method have shown to be able to greatly improve the performance on this traffic signal control. So now that we have covered uh, that it's possible to use domain knowledge to guide um, or to use such kind of domain knowledge in different types of learning strategies like in the design of loss functions or in uh, doing this initialization of machine learning models. But in the following slides, we're gonna show that it's also possible to use such kind of domain knowledge to even modify the internal structure of these machine learning models. So we start with encoding intermediate domain variables. So basically we see these days, these uh, neural network models or uh, deep learning models, they have found a lot of success in different applications. And the power of these types of models mainly comes from their ability to extract these hidden variables or hidden units in the middle layer. So these hidden variables are basically some abstract representation uh, that are, um, we hope that these hidden representation are more relevant to our prediction tasks. But in practice, if we only have access to limited number of training data, then these learned hidden representations can be less meaningful. So something we think uh, we propose here is that we can enforce to learn some domain variables in the middle layer so that we can force these machine learning models to learn patterns or learn these representations that are consistent with our known domain, domain knowledge so that the model can become more generalizable. So here we use the same example of modeling lake water temperature. So basically remember like in this example, we are trying to maintain a lake energy budget, which is the lake thermal energy. And this lake thermal energy is affected by the difference between incoming and outgoing energy fluxes. So if we have more incoming energy than the outgoing energy, then this lake energy budget should increase, right? So um, one approach to model this, model this, uh, this phenomenon is that um, we can construct a new architecture to force the model to uh, memorize such kind of energy transfer process. And specifically, we start with building the standard recurrent neural network. So basically here we show in this black colored arrows, this black colored arrows represent the standard recurrent neural network framework, where uh, we also use the RSTM cell as a recurrent cell structure. But on top of that, 
we also introduce another recurrent process, which is shown in this blue color. So in this blue color, this energy flow, we also introduce another set of physical states and physical variables. So here, basically, these physical states are very similar to the LSTM states used in the standard recurrent, uh, recurrent neural network model. But the difference is that this physical state, they have some real-world interpretation. So that means um, they, they correspond to some real physical variables. And in our example, in this uh, late temperature modeling example, these physical states represent the late thermal energy at every time step. And the physical states at, at each time step can be calculated by combining the physical state at previous time step and also some intermediate physical variables. And here, these intermediate physical variables basically include different types of energy fluxes like solar radiation, uh, basically this incoming and outgoing energy fluxes and so on. So remember like in our previous, um, when we previously talked about this example, we mentioned like lake thermal energy, the change of lake thermal energy is dependent on the difference between incoming and outgoing energy fluxes. And by introducing or by using this additional energy flow, we actually, we are expressing the same kind of relationship. The physical state is dependent on the previous physical state and also this additional net gain of energy fluxes. So by using this energy flow, basically we're trying to force this machine learning or this recurrent neural network model to capture this kind of energy transfer process, uh, which really drives the change of temperature in these lake systems. So that's how we can encode some intermediate physical variables in a machine learning architecture. And we can further extend this framework to model some even more complex scenarios. And here, this example is about modeling water temperature in river networks. So the river network is more complex because we have to consider the interactions between different uh, river segments. So basically, this river seg uh, the river networks consist of multiple uh, river segments, and these river segments can be connected with each other. So for example, here we show a very small network with just three river segments, A, B, and I. But there's a lot of frequent interactions between them. For example, the water can uh, get evacuated from upstream A and B to the downstream segment I. So this water, when it merges from upstream segment A and B to the downstream segment I, this water can directly impact the change of water temperature for this downstream segment I. So actually, this kind of relationship can be uh, very naturally modeled by using a graph convolutional neural network, because we know that this graph convolutional neural network can automatically figure out uh, such kind of influence between different amongst different nodes in a graph. So if we represent each river segment as a node in this graph, then we can uh, do the edge from A to I and from B to I so that we can uh, propagate influence from the upstream segments to the downstream segment I. So basically here we see that uh, when we calculate this RSTM cell state for the downstream segment I, we also incorporate the hidden states from a and B, so basically we call them HA and HB. So HA and HB are, are the hidden units extracted from upstream segments. And then after some transformation, we convert them into QA and QB, and then these hidden variables QA and QB are going to be passed to the RSTM cell um, to model water temperature for the downstream segment I. But in the standard convolutional graph convolution neural network, all these hidden variables are learned uh, automatically so they, they may be just some abstract representation. But, and these kind of hidden variables can become less meaningful if we just train this model directly using limited amount of uh, training data, as we just mentioned. So one way is that we, we want to enforce some domain knowledge so that we can guide the learning of these hidden variables, so make them more meaningful. And according to the energy conservation law, we know that the change of temperature is dependent on the difference between incoming and outgoing energy fluxes, and also is dependent on additional uh, net heat advantage from the upstream segments. So basically, this term HADV is, measures the impact from upstream segment A and B to the downstream segment I. So this should be the information that's going to be passed or propagated in this graph network. So, and also according to the physical formula, we know that this HADV term can be calculated as a function of a set of intermediate physical variables. So these intermediate physical variables are basically some physical properties of this upstream segment A and B. So they include like stream flow, like the temperature, 
uh, of these segments. And actually, it's very intuitive because we can imagine like when the water gets uh, when the water merge from this A and B to the downstream segment I, then this stream flow, like the velocity of these uh, rivers and also its water temperature can directly impact the water temperature change for the downstream segment I. So that's why we have to estimate these intermediate physical variables. So, um, so what we do is we represent these intermediate physical variables using the symbol SA and SB in these dashed circles. And then we define new loss function such that we can extract. So by minimizing this loss function, we are trying to ensure that we can extract this set of intermediate physical variables SA and SB from these hidden units QA and QB. So if we can extract these uh, variables SA and SB from QA and QB, then it means this QA and QB, these hidden units, indeed contain sufficient information to represent these intermediate physical variables. Then once QA and QB are passed to this RSTM cell for the downstream segment, then this RSTM structure can gather sufficient information to represent or to estimate this term HADV. So this is basically the impact from upstream to, seg uh, to downstream segments that we're gonna estimate. So basically this method have shown to be able to greatly improve the prediction performance for water temperature and also make the model more generalizable because we enforce some very general physical relationship here. And also here we talk about some other examples of encoding other types of more general domain specific knowledge in uh, these two, uh, two applications. The first example is about predicting uh, human ages from neural images. And this, is, this work is published in 2018 by Sternfels. Um, so basically what they do is they introduce additional um, neural, network, uh, neural network layer at the beginning to segment this brain modem into different regions. And this segmentation is based on our domain knowledge about neural images. And then this information from different regions can be treated as uh, different channels and get fed into the following convolutional layers. And this method have shown to be able to improve this prediction performance. And the reason is that by using this first layer, this segmentation layer, we can, expect, uh, we can extract some more representative or more descriptive features. And also those features should be more relevant to this prediction task because these segmentation tasks is, is, uh, is based on certain domain knowledge uh, in this neural neuro, neuro image domain. And the second example is about uh, a data generation. Basically, we are trying to simulate um, the super resolution fluid flow. Okay, so this method is based on, again, uh, the general, general, uh, generative uh, adversarial uh, network. So remember, like in a uh, standard GAN-based model, we have a generator and also we have a, a discriminator and they're combating with each other. So here they extend the standard GAN model to um, by introducing uh, two different discriminators. And one discriminator is used to preserve such kind of spatial coherence of this simulated data. And the other one is based on the, uh, is, is, is used to guarantee this temporal coherence. And the design of the, both of these two discriminators are based on certain aspects of domain knowledge in this uh, in CFD. So, the idea of all these approaches that we have seen that using um, domain knowledge in designing machine learning architecture is that um, by using such kind of DK informed model architectures, actually we can greatly reduce the search space for model parameters. So we can regularize certain layers or certain hidden units. And so in this way, we can reduce the search space for model parameters. And that's why we can train this model using uh, maybe much fewer number of training samples. And also by uh, enforcing this kind of domain knowledge into the model architecture, actually these machine learning models have higher chance at learning uh, patterns and relationships that are consistent with our um, known prior domain knowledge. So in this way, because this domain knowledge can um, hold in different scenarios, so our machine learning models can also uh, become more generalizable in different scenarios. And here we talk about a more general uh, problem of search for the optimal um, neural uh, network architectures. 
And we have the same objective here, which is to learn a predictive function uh, f from input features x to the output uh, target variables y. But here, the hypothesis space consists of not only the network parameters, but also the architectural parameters. So basically, we have to determine, like, for example, what kind of connections should we use to, uh, to connect each pair of hidden units or from hidden units to the output units. For example, whether we should use the fully connected layers or whether we should uh, use the steep connection layers, um, and so on. But here, what these authors proposed in this paper published in uh, 2019 is that we can also include some physical operations as additional options for defining these connections between hidden units to the output units. And for example, like consider the problem of modeling the trajectory of a ball after we tossing it for some time. So according to this uh, free falling equations, uh, we can have a rough guess of the position of this ball after we toss it for a certain amount of time. And by including such, uh, such options uh, in this neural architecture search problem, actually it provides us with more flexibility. Because we can imagine like, if we don't have sufficient training data, then we may prefer to use such kind of physical operations. Because we can, we can notice that this kind of uh, relationship defined by these physical operations, they're relatively fixed. So they don't require much tuning. So this relationship is already well defined. So that's why they don't require uh, much training data to tune those parameters in this relationship. But on the other hand, if we, if we already have sufficient training data, then we may prefer to use machine learning or purely data-driven based connections. And the reason is that by using these kind of purely data-driven based connections, we may have higher chance to do a better or do a more, a more accurate predictions. And that's because we can see that these these equations like free falling equations and, and some other um, physical uh, operations, they're usually based on many assumptions. And those ass assumptions may not always hold in different, um, in real practice. So that's why uh, uh, the author proposed this kind of hybrid uh, framework where, where, uh, where we can um, intelligently choose like whether we wanna use this kind of physical operation or this purely data-driven approach to define this a neural network architecture. And here we also list some more literatures to uh, incorporate domain knowledge into machine learning models. So um, uh, previously we have shown that uh, it's possible uh, to use domain knowledge in designing the architecture for neural network architectures, a neural network model like the hidden layers, like the, um, the hidden layers and also uh, and also like the, uh, the entire structure, like the additional, uh, additional layer or the hidden units. But also here in some works they have talked about, it's also possible to use such kind of domain knowledge in guiding the, uh, our, uh, the design of the kernel for Gaussian processes. And also uh, in many um, scientific domains, um, they have commonly exist such kind of monotonic relationships. For example, um, we know the relationship between water density and the water depths. So for example, the denser water in the lake system should always stay, stay uh, in the lower part of the water column. So there are also some previous works that sh have shown that it's possible to preserve such kind of monotonicity uh, uh, relationship in the machine learning models. And such by preserving, uh, by preserving such kind of relationship, we can also improve our prediction performance. And also by using domain knowledge, we can also better tell like which groups of tasks are more relevant with each other. So this can help us select, uh, select auxiliary tasks in doing multitask learning. Because only by select the relevant groups of tasks, then we can uh, learn knowledge from one task and then use such learned knowledge to guide the learning in the other task. And to conclude this uh, tutorial, so we have shown that um, there are so many different approaches uh, for learning with small amount of data. And we believe such kind of research actually uh, can be very promising, uh, very useful uh, in many cases, because we can easily find many use cases uh, in, our really, uh, in our daily life where this data collection can be very challenging or uh, uh, the, the manual labeling can be very expensive or can be very uh, time consuming. Like for example, in our lake modeling case, uh, collecting these samples, the label samples from one single day may cost like 
um, two thousand dollars. So it's a lot of money, and also uh, it requires um, like domain experts to do this labeling. So we cannot find some random people to do this labeling. So that's also a lot of uh, substantial uh, human effort involved. And in particular, uh, our approaches uh, that cover in this tutorial can mainly fall into these two categories. One is to transfer knowledge from auxiliary tasks, and the other one is to transfer knowledge from domain experts. So um, basically, the idea is quite simple. Like, if we don't have sufficient information from our training data, then we have to take it from somewhere else, either from auxiliary relevant tasks, or we should take it from some accumulated knowledge in specific domains. And specifically for, uh, specifically for the, for the uh, first topic, transfer knowledge from auxiliary tasks, we cover three different methods, transfer learning, multitask learning, and also meta-learning. And in meta-learning, we also covered like two major challenges. Uh, one is the task heterogeneity, and the other is uh, meta-overfeeding. And then for the second topic, transfer knowledge from domain experts, we have shown that it's possible to use such kind of domain knowledge to guide the design of our loss functions, and also for doing the uh, model initialization. And finally, um, we have also shown that it's possible to use these domain knowledge to guide the design of model architectures. So that's uh, pretty much about everything about this, um, this tutorial. And really, thanks for listening. So please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you.